Alright, so how many people know what X star is? Just a few that don't. How many people know about the biogas roadmap? Don't mind me. Okay, because I'm gonna, I pretty much have everything on the slides, so I'm not really gonna read the slides to your all adults. Um, I really wanna have more of a conversation about it, what it means, where it comes from, why we did it, why we have it, how it can help you. So, but I do want to start with where it came from, why we have it, frame it a little bit for you, give you the 10 second overview, and then really talk about what's going on now, what it means in the future, and have a chance for you to have some conversation with me about it, ask all of your burning questions. So you've already heard a lot from Bill, and I apologize, they told me that the clicker doesn't work, so I have to hide back here behind the podium. But you heard from Bill Hohenstein yesterday about the um, greenhouse gas emissions of the U.S., I'm going to focus here on the fact that methane is 10% of it, and if you look at agriculture, we're only about 9% of the overall total emissions, but when you look at methane emissions, it's going to be a slightly different picture. And wanted to point out that over 60% of the methane emissions do come from human activity, so um, we do have an impact and our practices can change that. Now, as I said, when you look at methane, if you add the enteric and the manure management and look at livestock's impact, it's a much bigger percentage. You go up to 36%, and then it's more important in the natural gas systems and coal mines. So a lot of people always say, what can we do about these agricultural emissions? Now, in terms of overall greenhouse gas emissions, I know I'm going back and forth here, but there are also nitrous oxide emissions and um, from the agriculture sector, and those you know, are not a short-lived climate forcer, so we don't talk about those quite as much. Um, short-lived climate forcers, so methane and um, black carbon and hydrofluorocarbons, I'm sure I'm leaving out a few syllables there, we just call them HFCs in my world. Those are greenhouse gases that have a huge impact in the short term, so if you fix them, you can have an impact in the near term, as opposed to waiting 200 years to see an impact, if that helps make a difference. And when we talk about methane emissions from the ag sector, you've got enteric fermentation and you've got manure management, so how you're putting that manure in legumes. You've also got rates cultivation, crop residues, some other factors. So there are all sorts of programs around the world looking at how we can bring down these emissions. And of course, we love to really focus on the ones that possibly are cost effective, we already have technologies for. And so that's why you don't hear a lot about enteric, because we're already doing a lot of things in terms of feed and stuff, but there's no silver bullet in that world yet. So then people focus on manure. And one of the big things is that agriculture sector emissions are going up. And two of the major drivers that are usually cited for this in the US are that we're using more liquid manure management systems. And then there are also some soil emission factors playing in there. So when you think about this, um, as Bill mentioned, the U.S. did not sign off on the Kyoto Protocol. And so, you know, here's the U.S., this big superpower, this big economy, and we're kind of quiet internationally about climate. What's the U.S. going to do? And so we do have a, a climate goal of reducing our U.S. emissions by 17% by 2020 from the 2005 levels. And, but we haven't really talked about this. So the president released the climate action plan in June of 2013 that said not only are we going to reduce our emissions, but we want to get the U.S. ready for those impacts. We know that sea level is going to rise some. We know we're going to have more hurricanes, more severe weather, more droughts. Um, you know, those things are going to get worse. And you've heard about that from a lot of presentations. So not only do we want to reduce our emissions, but we do want to be prepared for all of those things that we know are going to happen anyway. And we really want to step up and be a leader in international efforts because you can't fix the climate over your own city and not have any impacts from other places. It's all interconnected. So we really want to be a big part of that. And part of that climate action plan specifically said that the government agencies were going to look at methane and produce a strategy for how we're going to reduce emissions here. And again, they focus on methane not only because it's a potent greenhouse gas, it has over 20 times the impact of carbon dioxide, but it also has a lot of co-benefits. So if you reduce methane, you can also reduce odor, you can have health impacts, you can have economic impacts, you can have safety impacts. When you have talk about oil and gas and coal systems, by reducing methane emissions, you're reducing the chances that those blow up, you have a whole worker safety issues. So there are all these other things that you get by helping the climate. And then one of the biggest key factors is that 
we do have technologies and best practices to reduce methane in these sectors. They're already available, and in some cases they are, or have in the past some time, been cost effective. So we really want to look at how we can do those kind of low-hanging fruit actions first. And there's some great little stats there about how much impact this can have. So, um, just stick here for a second. The strategy to reduce methane emissions um, involved USDA, DOE, the Department of Energy, Agriculture, Environmental Protection Agency, as well as some of the other groups, um, interior transportation, all of those, came together, they sat and they said, what can we do? And they focused on the four major methane emitting sectors. They looked at agriculture, coal mines, oil and gas systems, and landfills. Everything except agriculture, some of their main strategies, they had voluntary things, but most of them were to look at regulations and either add new ones or um, amend existing ones, make them a little stronger. And of course, agriculture said, no regulations here. We don't want those. So USDA and the Dairy Innovation Center, representing the dairy industry, had signed an MOU the year that year, the year before, um, that said you know they would work together to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the dairy sector. One of those things was that USDA had promised the dairy sector they would do a biogas roadmap for the sector to look at how to reduce um, methane emissions specifically through the use of anaerobic digesters. So USDA jumped up and said, hey, we have a great idea. We've got this biogas roadmap that we promised to. Let's put that in the strategy. So the agriculture strategy said, we'll keep working through our existing programs at all the agencies, and we'll do a biogas roadmap. So we had some great discussions, and um, the three key agencies that are really involved in this sector are EPA and USDA, but also DOE. And we'd worked together earlier that year on a technology market summit to look at how we can bring environmental technologies to market build on market forces and really increase the sector. It was a great meeting. We had a great relationship between the three agencies. So we said, great, we'll work together on this roadmap. And we said, but you can't look at just dairy biogas. And you can't look at just livestock biogas. Um, you know, there are already technologies existing. They also work in wastewater treatment. They also work on landfill gas. It's all the same gas, slightly different concentrations here and there. But we can really learn from each other. It would be much better if we look at it collectively than just in one little sector. So that is how the agricultural strategy also includes wastewater and landfills. Um, but together we got together, we published this roadmap, and the goal really is to stimulate the market. We want to make it easier for this sector to grow. Now, the Innovation Center for US Dairy, again, had signed this MOU with USDA, and we said, well, you've got to be part of this. And clearly, the American Biogas Council has a key role to play, represents all the major stakeholders. So we wanted them in it, too. So industry also was a part of the development and continues to be a part of the work group today. Um, what's in the roadmap? First of all, let's look at, again, I have the goal is to stimulate the, the sector. But the purpose, really, when we sat down and talked between the agencies and the industry, they said, a, you guys need to keep working together. It needs to be formal. You need to you know, really collaborate. This can't be a, an ad hoc thing. B, they said, we really need government to say that these are legitimate technologies. They have a viable place because the bankers, you know, they know the history. They know they failed way back in the day. And you know, they don't really care what the, invest, what the equipment providers say when they come to the bank. Like, they need numbers. They need a market signal. They need assurance. And then they said, You've got some great programs, but they're not really working for us in the best way possible. Perhaps you can tweak some of your programs and make them better. And so these are the things that kind of fed into the roadmap. Now, most of you hopefully know about biogas, so I'm gonna skip a lot of this, but just say, you know, it's really important in the sector. It has a lot of co-benefits, especially on farms in rural areas. And overall, there are about 1,241 systems in the wastewater industry, according to a work study a couple years ago. As of March, we recorded 247 operational systems in the ag side, and we have about 650 landfill biogas systems operating. So overall, there are around 2,000 systems operating. It's a lot of technology. That's a lot of learning experiences. Now, um, LMOC, the Landfill Methane Outreach Program, and AgStar, my program, have done studies of where um, Digesters are technically feasible, and at one point they were economically feasible in our sectors. <laughs> and then WERF had done a study of all of the wastewater treatment plants over a certain capacity. 
So really, this 11,000 biogas systems are technically feasible. This number gets thrown around everywhere, but it's only a part of the potential because we only looked at the really large systems in these three sectors. And we didn't look at anything in standalone food recovery. We didn't look at where you could co-digest on smaller operations or bring things into wastewater treatment plants in rural areas. So this is a great number on a very conservative small side. And then we've had some really great scientists at EPA that study, you know, if carbon prices were this or that, like how many people would adopt certain technologies. So depending on cost effectiveness, you can have different levels of impact because basically it's just saying to get different levels of adoption depending on how much um, you can make for that. So why aren't we at those 11,000 plus systems? Money, 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 money. Um, it's usually the best answer. They're really <coughs> capital intensive. They don't really make a lot of money. You heard from John. Um, some people do make money off of them. That's great, but you're generally not going to go into this as your like nest egg retirement plan and build some systems and retire and live happily ever after on your own private island. And then the markets don't really exist for the products. Um, sometimes you can sell them locally, but it's not really a mature thing where it's a standard product. It depends on every system, different amounts. It's really hard to break into like a fertilizer market or things like that. And we don't put a value on things like carbon credits in all areas or nitrogen and phosphorus credits and all these great benefits that you're getting, the odor reduction. You can't really say, oh great, you reduced order, we're gonna give you this check for this amount because you reduced it by this amount. It just doesn't work like that. So, the virus roadmap said, there are four areas where specifically the government and or industry can work that will help provide the environment for a bigger market for biogas recovery. We can promote it through our existing programs, we can foster investment, we can strengthen markets, and we can improve how we talk about it and how we coordinate. And so we laid out some specific examples in each of these areas. Again, we have technical assistance programs, we have funding programs, we have outreach programs, we have R&D programs. Let's use those. And then let's make it easier to finance them. Let's get some NICS codes. So if you're trying to look at at an industry, usually you search the NICS code and you can find all the sorts of data about it, but there's no specific NICS code for this. And that's just a standard kind of industry classification term that you use on funding documents and grants and all sorts of things. It doesn't exist for biogas, so you can kind of search here and there and make some assumptions, but it's really not very useful. So let's get a NICS code. Let's enhance our financing. And then, you know, the federal government, all of our agencies have mandates to reduce our emissions to buy renewable energy. But there's no specific carve out to biogas, so let's look at that and see if we can lead by example. And then let's really lead and provide some unbiased information about what these systems really are capable of doing, what the benefits are, and um, you know, drive the creation of some tools and information there. Finally, we said we would have a working group and we would also you know, communicate externally in a better way. Um, I really commend John Fiscalini. He said he went to the, the government websites and he was searching for the regulations. If any of you tried to do that, it's like, it's an exercise. And if you actually find what you're looking for on any government website, you've really like, deserved a PhD just for that. So um, <laughs> we, we know we have a lot of work to do, and we said this sounds really stupid. We actually put a line item in there to make our websites better and easier to find information. And then this, this one key little bullet was that we published a progress report in August 2015. And here I'm going to pause and say, You've noticed the title was the Biogas Opportunities Roadmap, and if you've been paying attention to all these things in it, you see it's not like a typical roadmap where you outline like these major steps the market's gonna take or the industry's gonna take in these years that you're gonna do it. We said we're really not there yet. There are no broad analyses of the market and like what steps are needed and what impact they would have. And we had about three months to write that first roadmap, so there wasn't really time to do those great studies that we wanted. And one of the, one of the agencies that was involved stepped up you know, like a week before we were all supposed to announce the roadmap and said, it's not a roadmap. We're not sure we can sign off on it. And they said, but if we call it an opportunities roadmap, and we promised to do a report in a year, then we'll agree to it. So. That's how we got the progress report and the opportunities in the middle of the title. 
Um, so fast forward to, I don't know, April, May of this year. The White House comes calling and they said, well, you promised you're going to have this report on what you've done in a year. Where are you at? And suddenly I guess it's time to talk again. So we've been working really hard every week. Um, again, kind of on a short time schedule. The exciting thing is that we really all have been working very hard over the past year to make some big differences. So I've aligned these with um, the titles in the roadmap to make it a little easier for the presentation. <coughs> but clearly we've got our existing programs, voluntary programs that have continued to put out tools and information and fact sheets and work. And then DOE is one of those clean cities programs so most of you know the DOE, maybe you don't know. DOE's bubble in the federal government is research and development. So in this space, they're not interested in funding digesters. That's kind of a done technology. They're interested in funding research and development in terms of next generation fuels and bioproducts and things like that. For the past few years, there's been a lot of um, discontent in the industry that they weren't focused on biogas because the main office that's focused on them, the Bioenergy Technologies Office, their mandate was um, what they call dry wastes, if you will, so crop residues, things like that that are generally dry feedstocks, because they're really concerned about biomass and working on the biomass research and development. So just in the past year, though, they've added wet wastes to their mandate, and what that is is that's manure and wastewater treatment plant biosolids and all of those other wet things that are waste that can be used for bioproducts and biofuels. So it's really a huge jump for them, um, but it sounds kind of funny to go around saying, well, do you finally added wet wastes? All right. Um, so kind of have to add that. And then the Department of Agriculture, you heard about their building blocks to climate smart agriculture yesterday. One of those included the, um, the point that they would support 500 new systems. They also had some other ones on renewable energy. They partnered with some private firms to drive investment in different things. So both of those agencies have really um, stepped up to, to say we are working in biogas. And again, EPA kind of has this mandate for the environment, for climate change. So we already have all these programs that support it. Then um, fostering investment. <coughs> again, because DOE is now focused on wet waste, they're starting to look at what their strategy is for the next five years, where they can make the most difference in funding things on the research and development side. They're working with the other agencies to say, what should we work into our programs? It's, it's been great. Um, I'm gonna skip the manure one for a second. Um, REAP and the biorefinery programs from USDA both have done final rules. Glenn's gonna have to tell me if I'm doing something wrong here. Um, but so that's really exciting. REAP now has an annual kind of minimum funding amount. So instead of having to wait each year for Congress to act and set a funding level, there's at least some guaranteed money in that program. Equip can be used for digesters as well. You can stack the programs, assuming you write the grants for different parts of your system. And we've heard that even though that's been allowed for years, a lot of states don't necessarily know about that. So they're really working internally on how they can communicate that better, make sure everybody knows. EPA. Had our Office of Water, this isn't directly related to digesters, but um, the government's really big on challenges and innovation challenges. So they've launched one on manure nutrient recovery technologies. And again, it doesn't have to involve a digester, but the challenge will set a criteria statement that says, you know, we are interested in companies who can produce the technology that will remove X percent of nitrogen or phosphorus at X percent at X cost or at you know 10 percent lower than current cost or whatever. So they're working right now with industry and other government agencies to develop these criteria statement and they hope to launch the challenge in August or September. So that's been really great and they hope to keep repeating it to driving the industry forward step by step by step if that's what it takes. Um, so they're really looking at how we can partner with industry and keep moving things forward instead of just through our, our traditional programs. And then industry. There's a whole process for getting the next code. It's like a three-year thing. You have to apply and, and petition and this, that, and the other. And so the industry did submit that. A lot of us support, wrote supporting comments from the federal government. So that will continue to work its way through the system. And then um, we've continued, of course, fact sheets and models, 
Um, NRCS pointed out that a lot of the conservation, a lot of the environmental credit markets have all been supported by conservation innovation grants. So um, there's great interest in seeing how we can keep using those sorts of grants to um, continue programs, continue moving markets. The American Bios Council is working on a digest digestate classification system, so a standard testing protocol and labeling. Um, criteria, standards, templates for digestate products so that consumers can start to understand what they are, have some certainty in what they're getting. And then as I mentioned, um, we have been working on our website. So EPA is going to unveil a new cross-cutting biogas website this fall in addition to our kind of sector-specific areas like AgStar. Um, ABC has been working with the USDA to make a portal where you can learn about the research that USDA has funded in the biogas area and what the results were so we can start getting some information out about all this money that's been spent and what can we do with it. And DOE, or um, Climate Clean Cities Program, have um, been reworking on their websites as well. So all the information is online that I've talked about, but I really wanted to get more into your questions and what comes next. What do you want to know about the government and our role? And just turn this over to you for I think I've got about ten more minutes. 